Good morning and welcome. I'm Raisa Rodriguez, Associate Executive Director for Policy and Advocacy at Citizens Committee for Children. Please note that today's programming um, is available with closed captioning should you need. I am excited to be with you this morning, although what we will be discussing is profoundly troubling. Welcome to our second out of five Real Talks in the month of October. Real Talks is a collaboration between Citizens Committee for Children, FPWA, and United Neighborhood Houses that grew out, that grew out of our collective urge to respond to the urgency of this moment, to actively confront racism, inequity, and injustice. If ever there was a moment to address the pervasive presence of race and class-based disparities and the issues we grapple with each day as advocates, service providers, and sector leaders, it is now. There is no better time. We see these unjust racial disparities in the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on black and brown communities. We also see these disparities in the senseless loss of black lives at the hands of police and white civilians. It is true, at this time we are called not only to fight against COVID-19 pandemic, but the pandemic of racism inflicted on black and brown communities. These inequities have long existed and are built in by design into our systems. Real Talk aims to bring attention to system, systemic barriers and systems change in order to finally achieve real equity. Today's focus is housing equity. Housing equity has played a significant role in the disparate impact of COVID-19. The data confirms that communities hardest hit by the virus are communities that were facing risks associated with housing instability even before the pandemic. Risks like overcrowded housing, severe rent burden, and large numbers of children and families entering the shelter system. It is impossible to have a discussion on housing inequities and racial injustices without starting with the issue of family homelessness. In New York City, just about 65% of the Department of Homeless Services shelter system is comprised of families with children. More than one out of 10 New York City public school student lacks a home of their own. And in some communities, communities facing inequities every day, that ratio is much, much higher. Black and Latinas households make up 95% of the city's shelter system, 95%. So it is undeniable that housing and homelessness is very much a racial justice issue of our time. I'm going to start with what our ask is of you today. We hope you will keep learning, we hope you'll keep talking, and we hope you'll stay engaged and push with us in the fight for equity. In the chat, you'll find the registration link for upcoming Thursday Real Talks centered on mental health, education, and criminal justice. Now let's talk family homelessness. CCC is a lead organization in the Family Homelessness Coalition, comprised of a diverse group of stakeholders working to promote policy solutions to combat family homelessness. In February of this year, before COVID changed all of our lives, the Family Homelessness Coalition released Portraits of Hope a photo project and documentary that included the stories of six brave women and shared, who shared their experiences with housing instability. Before I invite our first speaker, Khadija Davis, a housing fellow on the Family Homelessness Coalition, I'd like to share with you a brief clip of her story as told by her in Portraits of Hope.
my daughter and I had to go to a shelter because the person I was living with, I just could not be with her anymore. Honestly, she's making a place unsafe for me and my daughter. And I just didn't want my daughter to be in that environment. I was unhappy being there, and she just made it that I had to leave. It was, it was really, really hard. My daughter at the time was like one, two years old. I was in Queens. I would have to get up sometimes five o'clock in the morning with my daughter to get her ready to go to school in Brooklyn. Then also go to back to work in Manhattan and do the same thing coming back home in the nighttime. If you're in a situation right now and you're going in a shelter, just know, keep your head up. Don't let anybody make you feel like you're less than a person when you're not. You are still who you are at the end of the day. And this is just one problem you might have, but you're gonna get through it. Audio, Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, I am excited to have Khadija with us today. She will not be joining us by video today, but it is her voice that we need to hear at this time. Khadija, welcome. Hi, good morning. Hi, Khadija. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us this Thursday. Um, we find it so important to really include voices like yours um, when we talk about policy solutions to this issue. I really would love to hear from you and for you to share with our listeners what you see as the biggest issues facing families with children, especially during this pandemic. Problems right now with people in shelter and with children at this point, I would say that having time to really dedicate to their children while they're at home and doing remote learning is a big thing right now, especially if you're working from home, to do both, because you still need the money to come in, but you also need your child to get the education that they need to be successful in life for like, you know, in the, for the future. Other problems I see that they might have is also, when you're in a shelter, many people might not notice, you're not, well, you might, you're not able to keep your child at home when you're going out to work. You have to find a place for them. And with that being said, if you're going to work and you have no place to put your child, you cannot go to work because you have to stay home to watch your children. So that's also a big problem that they face in the shelter. They, they want to go to work to be, make their, their work life better, but they can't make their life better because they have to still watch their child. And they just need more resources like in that to take care of their children to also be, make itself you know, a better place. Also it's funding. For example, right now children are home because of remote learning. They eat more, they use more toilet paper, they use more soap and things and supplies at their home more than they would usually use. And because you would think that welfare would give you more money because of the situation, but right now they don't, they give the same amount of money. And because of that, it's gonna be very hard on the families to really help themselves if more resources are being taken out instead of being put back in to help them and their family to be stable and things like that. It could be very stressful in the shelter in general with being with your kids and being a shelter by itself is stressful, but being in a pan having a, being in a pandemic, twenty four seven with your child, is just an ongoing stress that you might have. You love your child, yes. At the end of the day, it's just you need some space, and with that, it could be a lot of more depression. I have a video that I talk about um, shelter and depression, and that's before the pandemic even happened. So I can't even imagine a person in the shelter right now who with their child every day, every second. It can be, be very overwhelming, and I think parents just need a little break from their children and things like that. Khadija, thank you so much. You raise um, so many issues that I know so many of us can relate to. Um, it really points to the fact that much of what you're facing, of what families like yours are struggling with, are, are things that we are all struggling with except with less resources. Um, thank you so much for your perspective. I wanted to get a sense from you, you know, we've had several conversations. Um, you're very passionate about these issues. I know how busy you are and how much you have on your plate. I'm curious if you can share with our listeners why you choose to be involved, why you choose to be an advocate, um, despite the fact that you're juggling so much. The reason why I picked to be an advocate well, first of all, if you couldn't tell, I used to be in a shelter. So I definitely know how it is 
to be in the shelter life and not have everything that you need. And when I was in the shelter before I went in, I didn't have the resources. I didn't know the information about how to be in the shelter, how to get out of the shelter. I thought that when you go in, you'll have all this help that you think you would get, and it's just not the case. Um, so I put information out there so people can get the information to be able to use it in their everyday life while they're in the shelter, and also to help people. I like helping people be better with themselves. But especially when you're in the shelter, you feel alone. Even though people are in the shelter with you, you still feel alone. And it's just, I want to help people not feel alone and also know that you one day you will get out of this. It's not your everyday, it's not going to be your life forever. You're going to be, get better. If I'm the person to help them get to the place they need to be, to be a better person and to really help themselves get out of the situation that they're in, I'm definitely happy to be that person. It's just important to help people, especially people in need who don't have as much resources as a regular person would have if they weren't in that situation. Khadija, thank you so much for your time. Um, your voice is exactly what we need um, to help us to learn from you and to really shape solutions. Um, anything you wanna share with us as a last thought in terms of what we need to fix this problem? I think that we need more resources, more money and funding for the people. Um, you might think that, you know, we get a lot of money, different things like that, but at the end of the day, people need the money to get out of their situation. And you don't want them to be on it for the rest of their life, but if you give them like a head start in not coming back to the shelter, and that's a lot of, another problem we have also, is that people go in the shelter multiple times because when they take them out of the shelter the first time, they didn't have the proper foundation. When you build a building, you need the foundation to be set properly, if not the building will crumble. And that's what's happened to a lot of families. You give them a start, but the foundation that you put them on is not solid. And if it's not solid, they are going to fall again. And that's what's happening. So we need to make sure we give them the right information when they leave, that they won't have to come back to shelter again and again until we start the family again and again. It's very hard. I'm not going to say everybody we're going to save and help like that, but if we just give them the proper start and get the proper funding and get the proper education and just give them the information out there to help them be a better who's the person that they need to be, they can be very successful. And that's about it. Khadija, thank you so much. I so look forward um, to continuing this work with you and including your voice in this work. Um, I assure our listeners, this is not, this is the, not the last time we'll hear from Khadija. Um, I encourage you all um, to stay tuned to learn more about the Family Homelessness Coalition. You can visit our website, including in, included in the chat, and make sure to view Portraits of Hope in its entirety. It is 10 minutes well spent. Khadija, thank you so much. Before we move on to the next segment of today's talk, let's listen in on what women fighting inequity every day have to say about necessary solutions. There needs to be a more holistic approach to helping families. The city, they they try to help, but it's more of a bandage on a bullet wound than anything. Our system is not working. Instead of building shelters, why don't you build some low-income housing? So I received the city FEPS voucher, and it's hard because a lot of people don't want to accept vouchers, which is illegal. They either don't accept you or they just don't want somebody who's in the system. And they also have to stop asking people who have never experienced a shelter life advice about the shelter. You can't change something you haven't experienced. I hope you gained from that as much as I did. Now let's talk housing. For the next part of our talk, we are joined by Braden Crooks, co-founder of Designing the We, and Kirk Goodrich of Monadoc, Director of Real Estate and Monadoc Development, who will share with us their respective work in community development and affordable housing. In the interest of time, their bios and respective organizations are included in the chat. We also wanna hear from you. 
please let us know your thoughts, your comments, your questions, and include them in the chat. We'll get, as, we'll get to as many questions as possible, time permitting, at the end of our program. Thank you both, Brayden and Kirk, for joining us this morning. Brayden, I'd like to start with you. What I've come to learn is that too often, we believe that issues related to housing development, community development, and other issues are too complicated to unpack. I myself find myself guilty of thinking that the notion of redlining, for instance, is too complicated. But in fact, it could not be simpler. It is an example, a clear as day, of policies that had led to decisions of where to invest, where to allocate resources, where to underinvest and underserve based on who lives in those communities, and often based on race. Braden, please provide us with some insight from your perspective on the history of redlining and other racist policies. But in particular, I would love for you to focus on how we see the consequences of these policies playing out in today's housing crisis. Welcome, Braden. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. And, and already, I think we've heard a lot um, and learned a lot about just how this system works. Um, and, you know, as you said, redlining, um, and I'm <clears throat> going to share my screen here in a sec um, to give, give folks a sense, um, you know, is um, housing policy, it's, you know, connected to financial policy and all these things, right? But Right, it's much more simple to your point, right? It's really about who gets to be valuable and who's worthy um, and how those decisions were made and really baked into the systems uh, and structures that we deal with today. Um, so as you said, I'm the co-founder of Designing the We, my other co-founder, shout out to her, April De Simone, amazing Bronx born and raised um, partner. And um, uh, so we created what's called the Undesign the Red Line exhibit. And I'm going to show you a couple images from that um, and talk a little bit about the history and connect it um, back to uh, what you were just talking about, which is what does it mean for today? Um, so bear with me as I do that. Hopefully this. Um, so the Undesign the Red Line uh, hopefully this works, um, exhibit um, is a traveling exhibit. We've had it in several places in New York, in the Bronx, in Brownsville, Brooklyn, in East Harlem, downtown. Um, and it talks about this history, which is, you know, how does structural racism and inequality really get designed into all these systems? And it's a story we don't tell. I didn't learn about redlining in school. I don't think most people have. Um, and we've heard, some of us on this call may have heard about redlining before, and I'm going to give a little bit of a background on it, because not only is redlining so consequential for who gets to build wealth, who gets to be valuable, who gets to join the middle class in America, but it's also really an important metaphor for that question of, you know, how do we create in our society, not only uh, how we treat people, but even in the systems and structures, who gets to be valuable. Um, this is a redlining map of the Bronx, uh, very typical map. 239 of these maps are made for across the country. So basically every city is going to get a map. Um, and, you know, here you start to see these maps are made in the 1930s, right? So what's happening? Um, you have the uh, New Deal um, being proposed Brayden, by... Sorry to interrupt. I don't, I don't believe our viewers can see the map. Ah, uh, Okay. I'm trying to, I, I'm switch pages here, but hold on, let me just try switching back and forth. Can you see it now? Perfect. Okay. So this is a map, um, yeah, as of the Bronx. And they're coming out with, in the New Deal, right? We're responding to the Great Depression, uh, creating middle-class wealth building programs and the social safety net and all these things that we're used to today. Uh, but the federal government in the 1930s is explicitly racist and really explicitly white supremacist. Um, and they want to bake into those systems and structures ways to make sure that only white folks are really gonna benefit from them. Redlining is how we do that with homeownership. 
So they're giving out, they create the 30 year mortgage and 15 year mortgage. They're giving out really low interest loans. They're insuring home loans, right? They're kind of opening up owning your own home as part of um, middle-class American identity, but okay. They don't want that, you know, um, people of color, new immigrants and others to get access to that. So the maps are actually a risk assessment system. Um, basically it's a credit score. So, you know, you and I have a credit score today, right? Well, back then we wouldn't have had a credit, personal credit score. And instead with these maps, they're essentially giving your neighborhood a credit score. Um, and there's only four, right? So you're either green, which is great. Definitely lend here, green light. Blue, which is second best, it's pretty good. Yellow, which is called declining. And finally red, which are called hazardous areas. Um, and here, if you're familiar with the Bronx, right, the, most of the whole South and Central Bronx is red. Um, yellow isn't that much better, to be honest. Um, and, um, you know, what this means is that these areas aren't going to get access to these home loans. Well, and because it's backed by the federal government, because uh, it's going everywhere, right, um, it's not just going to limit itself to these particular home loans. It's also going to be insurance rates, business loans, bank branch locations, all kinds of access to the financial system gets shut down in these neighborhoods uh, for, for, for large part or restricted. And this sends those neighborhoods on a pathway of decline and disinvestment because it's harder to sell a house, it's harder to start a business, you know. And these neighborhoods when they're first redlined are across the country, you know, very rarely, you know, they're not the blighted, abandoned, empty, dilapidated, places that you might think they might call hazardous. No, actually these are full neighborhoods. They have storefronts, right, with people shopping. They're not what we would think of um, uh, as, as you know, empty or, or disinvested, but they're going to become increasingly like that. Um, and, it, and that's because of redlining and policies connected to it, um, that they actually enter a cycle of dis decline and disinvestment. And the question is, of course, well, why do that to an area, right? Why cycle, put it into this cycle of disinvestment? And the answer is in the map. And so um, the answer, you know, you see these, might be able to see these numbers, it says C10, uh, D2, D4. Those correspond to what are called area descriptions, which are the, uh, gonna tell us, um, well, why is it yellow or why is it red? And we have an area description here and just wave at me if you can't see it. Um, and here's the area description um, for the Bronx. And you go down to line C, it says detrimental influences, Negro infiltration. Right, so here we're, the federal government, right, is gonna be completely explicit to say, there are hazardous people in America and we need to know where they are and where they're quote unquote infiltrating or sometimes they'll say invading. And this is particularly targeted towards black families, but also Hispanic families, Asian families. At this point in time, people they called foreign born new immigrants, which included Italian immigrants, Eastern European Jewish people. Um, you know, eventually uh, this, you know, a lot of those um, European immigrants actually become white at some point, right? We start to consider them white, whereas before we didn't. Um, and so, right, this is going to begin um, associating race and real estate value in a very profound, deep structural way. Um, and this has major consequences because um, it's going to, you know, white folks who can leave are going to get out of these neighborhoods because they don't want to see their property values decline. It's going to begin and accelerate an all process of hyper segregation that was already going on and which but gets worse until the 70s or 80s. And at the same time that we're concentrating people into red line neighborhoods, we're disinvesting and devaluing those neighborhoods. So you look at a family like April's family, right, who lived in D4 in the Bronx, bought a row house, right, thinking, um, you know, we're buying into the American dream of owning your own home. Well, guess what? Two things. One, um, you don't have access to these federally backed home loans, right? This great credit. So instead you're gonna be have it getting predatory lending and things like that, what was called a contract buy. And two, right, you bought in a redlined area. So you haven't bought the anchor asset that's gonna become the wealth of your family moving forward. You're gonna go underwater and you're gonna lose that money, right? And so that happens to millions of families across the country who were upwardly mobile, who were joining, perhaps joining the middle class. 
but saw that wealth destroyed. And that has never been repaired, right? That has never been undone. And the geography that this creates has never been undone. So you have um, a massively segregated geography across the US and you have this huge racial wealth gap, um, which is produced through housing and, and other assets. And so, you know, although redlining formally was made illegal, right, um, uh, you know, the legacy and the structures are still here. And that's one of the reasons why we say, you know, redlining is one of the ways that structural racism gets designed into cities and places. It's never been undone. It's never been undesigned. So what does that mean now? Um, and I think, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the solutions, but I think we, the focus on wealth, geography, um, ownership, who, who's owning, how is that ownership working? Um, and to really think about solutions, and, and it's not to say, you know, we need solutions, right, that, uh, um, and we need, uh, people need help all the time, right? But one of the um, uh, reports that we cite in our uh, exhibit is called Umbrellas Don't Make It Rain. Uh, which I really like the name of because it's talking about, you know, uh, we have a lot of programs uh, that are helping people, but we're not going deeper, right, to the, the effects of this historic wealth destruction versus the causes and going deeper to rebuild and repair um, the wealth that was destroyed. Um, and I think that interrogating that, like, how do we do that? How do we do that moving forward? Is this the system we want to use or do we want to change this system is a big question. Thank you so much, Brayden. Um, that was so helpful. I'm really glad you touched upon the issue, so many issues, including the wealth gap, um, the cycle of disinvestment. Uh, I want to turn to Kirk now. Uh, Kirk, you know, I'm sure in our work, in our, in our continued work on the coalition, we keep pointing to the affordability issue, right? Affordability has been, will continue to be um, an even greater concern as we turn to recovery. The recent snapshot of, house, of the household pulse data confirms what we already know. Households with children, particularly households with very low income, are disproportionately impacted by loss of income during the economic collapse. Kirk, considering, you know, we often describe this as a looming housing crisis, uh, you know, considering that so many uh, households with children are unable to make last month's rent and even more express a uh, lack of confidence in paying next month's rent. I'm curious from your perspective, um, if you could share with our listeners, what do you see as the scope of, of this issue, the crisis at hand, um, in particular, the barriers to building affordable housing? All right, so first race, uh, thank you for the invitation to be on Real Talk and, and I've heard good things and, uh, and Brandon, thank you for the good information, because I think you're right. Um, th that's not the history we get in elementary school or high school. Uh, we have to want to know the things you're saying to know it. Um, and and I really appreciate that. Race, I think I think um, I, I think the the crisis at hand, which I'll describe in a moment, is more of a symptom than it is a pro uh, the the real underlying problem. Right. So. In our city, and, and, and I'll give you stats for our city and circumstances in our city, but the reality is it's, um, it's a problem that's pervasive throughout the entire country, right? So in our city, the most vulnerable uh, families you, you gave, um, you, you, you began this by talking about homelessness. There are 60,000 individuals in homeless shelters, um, in DHS uh, homeless shelters, that doesn't include you aging out of foster care, it doesn't include families who are a part of the domestic violence HRA system. It doesn't include people who are doubled up, uh, people on the streets who are not formally in the system. Um, and um, add to that um, the people who are, um, you know, who are um, poorly housed, uh, underhoused, um, and housing insecure. Um, who are not part of a formal system and not part of those stats. And, um, and even during the, the best economic times over the last, last 10 years, the shelter population has um, grown um, you know, significantly. Um, 
you know, the housing authority um, in New York City has 170,000 units. Um, there's a capital repair deficit of about $32 billion, um, which the housing authority and the city are doing the best they can to address. But um, resources are in, um, you know, uh, or in short supply and we're in austere times. And so fun, uh, in a very fundamental way, even before uh, COVID hit, we were in um, a, a very serious housing crisis perpetually in New York. Um, the city has a vacancy rate um, on average historically of 2%. So we're in a very hot housing market where rents are really high and people's ability to afford it is diminished over time. COVID has sort of just exacerbated it among the poorest um, New Yorkers. And so you have people who were employed gainfully who are no longer, um, people who were receiving unemployment benefits um, and those are running out. So the crisis is only worse um, than, it, than it ever has been. And we were in a bad situation to begin with, even though we experienced tremendous economic times. But I describe this more of a, as a symptom than as the underlying problem, um, because to the point that Braden was making, the, um, the uh, Washington Post published a study that was released by the Federal Reserve a few weeks ago um, that said the, the median black family um, has wealth of approximately one eighth or 13% uh, um, of white families in the United States among Hispanics or Latinos, that figure is one fifth. Um, and we know statistically that 63% of all wealth in our country is typically from a home ownership and retirement accounts. Um, and so the, the wealth gap that exists in our country, um, you know, creates a situation where there is no safety net, right? When, when you don't have the ability uh, to build wealth, it, it compromises your ability to serve as a safety net for your sister, your brother, your kids, um, an extended family. And, um, you know, I'm from a single parent family. My mother bus trays in a hospital kitchen for 32 years at downstate in Brooklyn. Um, it was four of us uh, she raised uh, with not a lot of money. And I used to tell people before now, uh, growing up the way we grew up is like operating without a safety net. Um, and you're basically on your own. I started buying my own clothes when I was 13 years old. So the, the point I'm making is this wealth gap um, isn't only about um, the individual's um, ability to buy, buy a home and build wealth for themselves. It impacts our ability as black and brown people to help one another um, and our family members and our extended family and neighbors. And, and because we have lesser abi a, a less ability to, to accommodate people who may be homeless, uh, to, to uh, lend money to folks, uh, to help them in a variety of ways, you see the shelter population and the, uh, and the folks who are housing insecure disproportionately are brown and, and black people. And so this is all connected. Um, and so from my perspective, wealth building and, and the failure um, of our, you know, our um, housing policy to address uh, the wealth gap is probably the most intractable and solvable problem of our time. Um, we talked about the, the uh, differentiation in, in, in uh, uh, wealth among, between blacks and, and white families and Latino families and white families. In addition to that, um, the rate of home ownership is 44% uh, among black families is 73% among white households. 87% of white homeowners buy their first, first home before they're 35. That figure is only 53% for black homeowners. Uh, for black folks, if you own a home, on average, it's worth 48 grand less than uh, white homeowners. So we're buying at lower rates. Uh, we're buying later in life. And when we buy, our homes are worth less. Um, and all of these things contribute uh, to us building less wealth um, and putting our community, you know, in a position where we can't respond to any, we, you know, we can't respond to any any uh, crisis, and we can't be helpful to one another. We can't borrow to put our kids through school. We can't retire comfortably. We can't borrow to to start a business or help, um, you know, uh, family members in any material way. 
Um, and so from my perspective, you know, the, the, the situation we're in requires housing policy that focuses first and foremost on, on, on bridging the wealth gap and, and creating wealth among black and brown families, um, while at the same time um, helping the most vulnerable families in cities like New York and communities where you see the sort of um, housing insecurity that we have here in New York City. Thank you, Kirk, so much. Um, I want to turn a bit to solutions. So many, both of you highlighted a few already, um, but I want to dig a bit deeper into what you see as real solutions to this issue. Before we get there, I do want to address a few comments um, and maybe even a question that is very related um, to solutions. Uh, we did receive a comment uh, pointing to uh, the need to really focus on uh, the high risk that homeless men are facing or the disproportionate risk for single singles in the system. Uh, we recognize that our focus to elevate uh, family homelessness in no way um, takes away from that. We do, the, you're right, the number of singles uh, experiencing homelessness is on the rise. Uh, CCC is a child advocacy organization and our focus is really bringing attention to the fact that too many children are still growing up without a home. Um, having said that, we work with tireless advocates that work on the continuum, the system as a whole. Um, and if you are interested in working and keeping it real on homelessness facing men, uh, we will gladly connect you with some partners um, in that area. Uh, another question I got is related to gentrification. Um, we get asked, uh, does gentrification help? Does it mitigate the risk of redlining or does it make it worse? I think that's a, a perfect opportunity to answer that, but also to then bridge and, and talk more about what does it take to solve this issue? Uh, Brad, you want to go first or you want me to like? Uh, I'm happy to go first. If you want to, you're welcome. Sure. No, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback on you. Sure. Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. You know, um, I was thinking about this question of ownership, which I think is really key in our mind, which um, the whole, so much of the structural history of the US centers itself on ownership and um, this, uh, what systems uh, were, we have for ownership. You know, we work, um, you know, we use this exhibit as a, um, a real process of telling the story and the history and, you know, truth and reconciliation of like, we need to tell this story if we're ever going to understand how we got here and therefore create solutions for what comes next. Um, and, but we also work on the ground in, in communities and with policymakers and others to really think about how, how we're going to do that. And one of the places where we've worked uh, is Trenton, New Jersey. And, um, in Trenton, uh, you still have many neighborhoods that are really locked in the situation of disinvestment. And across the country, right, where we, you know, we, we've gone, taken this to many, many cities, um, you often find, you know, neighborhoods in one of two positions, just to bridge it to that question, either still locked in essentially a situation of redlining and disinvested and, and grappling with that, or speculated, gentrified, right, flipped, essentially, right? There isn't this third way, right, of like, how do we, how does the tide rise and that lifts everyone's boats? Um, because, uh, you know, you have this, this dichotomy, which is very endemic to the system. But in Trenton, right, a lot of these neighborhoods in the situation of still being very disinvested from redlining. However, and that means the property values are very low. However, the rental market is actually quite high. And um, someone was telling me, and um, we were talking about that, I don't have the source on top of my head, but it's a good framing, which they were talking about um, that if you buy a property in the US and you rent it out, your return on investment takes you about 10 years to make the money back. In Trenton, it takes three because the property values are so low, but the rents are still high. And so we work with plenty of people who've been renting their place for nine years in Trenton. Essentially, they bought it three times, um, you know, but they don't have access to home ownership or anything like that. And so folks were talking about, um, 
you know, things like rental assistance, uh, which are extremely important because it stabilizes a family. It, it helps, you know, it does a lot. But um, the wealth of that rental assistance, those rental assistance dollars is going to be built by the slumlords of China, right? That's where it ends. So we're like, okay, we actually really need to think about ownership and switching that system. And um, we're looking, working with the city of Trenton, um, who, who themselves own a bunch of properties to do a community land trust for first time home buyers and things like that, to get people scaling uh, with a, an affordable option for home ownership. And, um, and then, you know, the question um, about, uh, so, so that, so just to kind of put that in a framework, right, that's starting to think about how do we zoom out a little bit to the systems, follow the dollars, where are they going, where, how can we capture, recapture that for the neighborhood, rather than seeing it leave the neighborhood, things like that. Um, and I do, I do think that community-based solutions have their own um, uh, positives, because it's creating a network of people who can support each other, as, uh, as uh, Kirk pointed out, I think that that, um, that was really one of the things that gets upended through things like redlining, um, displacement that's happened is, is the disruption of those networks, which are vital. Um, and then yes, gentrification, um, you know, most, most people, most have housing advocates really fight against gentrification because it, um, it's a dramatic increase in rents usually uh, that, that forces displacement has caused homelessness, absolutely. Um, and it's mostly driven by real estate speculators, uh, in, especially in New York, uh, national and global real estate investment trusts um, that are making the dollars um, from this speculation. It's, it's less common, although that is happening, where you'll have, you know, white families moving in as buying a, a house. That, that, that is going on, but I, I think what needs to be highlighted are these people that are kind of pulling the strings and the policy behind that um, uh, that's, that kind of sets the stage um, for that. Um, you find that, you know, a lot of people, um, there's a lot of, it comes along with a lot of predatory practices, um, people, you know, kind of swindling um, existing homeowners, black homeowners out of their home. Uh, selling it at a lower rate than it's worth, things like this. So, um, you know, it, it's it's oftentimes right causing quite a bit of, of problems. Although there are people who um, who've owned in neighborhoods uh, for a very long time who've been able to sort of cash out, um, and there's something to say for that in terms of building wealth. Um, is it a is it something that's broadly building wealth across the whole community? Um, I don't think so, but um, yeah, these are the kinds of things that we can interrogate and sort of start to say, well, what's good? What, what are the parts that we, you know, want to want to look at as good? And what are we, you know, how do we want to challenge that? And how do we change these systems to be more equitable for everybody? So, um, so, so I think um, gentrification is always a challenging, um, a challenging topic for me. Um, one, um, my concern um, when folks, um, either real estate speculators or folks of higher incomes uh, begin to come into a neighborhood that's traditionally been working class or lower income, um, is one, um, displacement of uh, poor and working class renters and secondly, a phenomenon um, which as property values go up, people who grew up in those neighborhoods, their ability to, to afford to purchase a home in a the neighborhood they grew up is compromised. And, and that's a real thing. So there are a lot of people who grew up in Harlem and Bed-Stuy, you know, in the 60s and 70s and 80s who can't afford to buy there now. And, and, and that's, I don't think that's a good thing. But let me, let me uh, give you and, and I think that's a, a serious problem. Um, and I think Braden did a good job of describing it. But let me give you what I think the, the dominant problem um, that um, Black families um, have in our country. We own properties in cities, um, neighborhoods, and on blocks where nobody wants to live. Um, St. Louis, Detroit, Baltimore, 
uh, you could go on and on throughout the Northeast and Midwest. These are cities that have lost 40 to 60% of their populations. Those folks ain't com aren't coming back anytime soon. And the relative value of those properties are really low. And they're the life investment of those households who live in those cities. And, and it's a double whammy, right? So they're not building wealth, right? Because nobody's moving into those neighborhoods um, uh, to, uh, to create value. Um, the other part of that, uh, and so the, the ability to build wealth in a significant way um, is, is compromised. But the, you know, the other part of that is because those cities have lost so much of their population the ability, the, the tax base is eroded and the ability of people to, to uh, um, those governments to provide municipal services is compromised. So they're living in, in neighborhoods and in cities uh, that are largely abandoned. Um, their properties are not worth very much. And the services they get in terms of parks and schools and you know um, policing and everything else are far worse than in other cities that are more popular in the Southwest and the West Coast and the Southeast. And to me, the volume of people of color living in that circumstance in our country, where they can't build wealth and they're living in cities that have uh, poor services is the dominant urban planning problem um, of our time, in my opinion. Um, I think gentrification, um, um, is, is certainly a problem in the way Braden described, um, and I'm concerned about it, and I'm concerned about exacerbating it, particularly in cities like New York and Boston and, and on West Coast cities um, where their low vacancy rates and property values are going through the roof and there's a lot of speculation. But I'm, I'm more worried about um, the wealth gap that's exacerbated and the quality of life I see Black families have when they live in neighborhoods and cities that no one else wants to live in and what it means for their future um, and, and their kids and grandkids. And, and, and that is an unsolvable problem at the moment. Um, people have been trying to get me to, to go to Detroit to do work forever. And every time I, you know, I, I, and I tell them I did my time. I was in East St. Louis, Illinois. And, and, you know, when you look at these communities, the people are wonderful, they're resilient, but the economic, the macroeconomic trends are not allowing them the, to build wealth um, and to live comfortably for the reasons I said. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Kirk. It's so important. I, I'm glad you, you mentioned um, the depth of the problem and, and describe it as unsolvable. It's so easy to be discouraged, right? We've been at this for several decades um, we've been talking about this for some time in all types of circles. You know, I myself say, you know, I've been working on this X years. Partners say we've been on this forever. Um, and that seems like part of the problem, right? Like we, we're at this for so long, um, but are we moving the needle? Um, and I want to really have our listeners hear from you what you see are real differences that we can make. What is it solvable? What's the role of government? Um, what is what are practical things we can do now, um, even though we are in a fiscal crunch, right? We often hear, you know, advocacy right now, it is tough to do advocacy. Um, we are in a uh, dire fiscal climate, um, but we're trying to continue to elevate the, the need to invest not only in children, families, and communities uh, to make sure that we, don't, that we don't make this crisis worse. Tell us in your thoughts, in your view, what you see government can do. Kirk. Yeah, let's go, Kirk. Uh, me? Yeah, I, I think, uh, so uh, I think fundamentally, um, I, I always, um, I try not to use the word reparations because it's so loaded and everybody runs to their, um, you know, to their corners um, and puts on their mouthpiece and headgear. But the reality is, um, you know, there's a, there's a particular group of people that were discriminated against systematically and we have a wealth gap. And so the, we have to create programs um, that really bridge that gap. Um, fun, I'll start with a very simple thing. 
home ownership, affordable home ownership has been something that uh, the city of New York has done a lot of. What I would like to see, and the program has basically been built on it's a production program. So developers build a affordable housing and they sell it to people. I don't think that it takes a long time to develop and sell properties. I think that's too slow. Um, I think the city of New York and the state should create a program where they qualify people who are, you know, working class people, moderate income people, middle income people, and uh, give them a soft second mortgage um, to be able to go into the marketplace and buy existing homes. Um, and, and releasing people to buy existing homes in a lot of these neighborhoods that they currently can't afford um, is, is really key as opposed to waiting for developers through a city or state program to build housing. It just takes too long and you don't get to the volume. The other thing I would say, which I don't like, the very first thing I learned about when I was in um, uh, undergrad about affordable housing was limited equity co-ops. I think there are situations where that has value, but I think um, um, limiting the equity of folks who've traditionally been disenfranchised and have been able to build wealth when you ultimately help them buy a home is cruel. Uh, I think, I think um, we need to be able to buy a home and build wealth just like white folks do. Um, and, and if there's a government program that says, we're gonna help you buy a home, but we're gonna limit your upside, I don't think that works. Um, I, think, uh, uh, um, I think a limited equity co-op um, or CLT uh, has value in certain circumstances, but with respect to this particular issue of wealth building, I would like to see a program that allows people to build wealth in a meaningful way. Thank you for creating your thoughts. Yeah, so I think, um, I think that we, I think that the actually the topic of reparations is appropriate um, framework to put a lot of different policy into to start thinking about, let's say, a reparative approach um, to housing. Um, and, you know, one example of that, uh, just thinking about this was, um, you know, here's a small city, I won't name it necessarily, but like, right, looking around, they, they're they in the situation uh, that Kirk was describing where just con consistent disinvestment and, and suppressed property value and things like that. Um, and they're like, okay, we need to raise, raise some property values here so that we can raise more revenue for the city. Um, and they looked around and saw particular neighborhoods where, you know, people hadn't painted the house and the sh shutters were falling off and, you know, um, things like this. And they said, well, we have these building codes. Um, we just need to enforce them in these neighborhoods because I guess people are lazy, right? And they're not fixing up their houses. Well, guess what? You know, they're doing this uh, in the red line neighborhoods, <laughs> you know, and the reason isn't because people don't feel like uh, doing it. It's because of decades and decades of structural racism baked into who gets access to finance and all of this and redlining and things like that. And so of course people can't pay these fines, right? And um, they end up taking the houses with the tax lien, right? So basically they end up punishing people for being the victims of redlining. And this is very common, this type of approach, right? We were very used to in which, you know, without understanding this history without asking how did we get here, right, end up reproducing the uh, inequities of, of for another generation. And so what would be a reparative approach would be to say, okay, we're just going to give people, we're going to give people grants to fix up their houses, we're going to give people access to really easy credit, things like that, and start to bring money back into neighborhoods. Um, another thing, you know, um, to think about in terms of wealth is to look beyond, and I think that systemically we need to look beyond uh, homes as the, really the sole and main origin of wealth in the U.S. Um, you know, the the average cost, the median cost of a home, um, back when they were doing redlining um, and they were opening up the GI Bill, and you saw a lot of wealth being built through homes. Um, you know, was one time the median income. Well, today the average home is six times the median income. So it, homes, you know, this financialization, financialization of homes as a growth asset 
has created increasing an affordability. So those things are connected. Um, also, you look at mortgages, right? In the average market, you know, in some, the exception are gentrifying markets essentially today, but in the average market, you see about a 6% increase in value. Um, that is not accounting for the fact that the average size of a home, this is national data, so national data looks at the average size of the home has doubled anyway. A mortgage is often, depending on your interest rate, twice the cost of the house, maybe three times the cost of a house in interest over the course of the 30 year mortgage. So you're looking at really what is, although it is people's main asset, oftentimes, what is essentially a very expensive savings account. And in some sense, if you could say, well, let's say that we don't spend as much money on the home and we put that, the money that we would have put into our mortgage, we put into, you know, this a, a retirement account or we put into even just a savings account, you could pencil that out to show that you actually just have a lot more money. So um, this is one of the reasons why in a large scale looking at uh, things like CLTs can make sense. And especially I think when you look at getting affordable options for people to scale from, um, and then it remains affordable for the next family to come in um, and, and who are a first time home buyer. And one of the things that I think programs that can accomplish that. And I totally agree, Build it, the building new is part of the solution, but we really have to look at the existing stock because, um, you know, I think it's things like down payment assistant grants um, that come in maybe with um, something like a CLT so that, you know, as people scale to their second home or what have you, right, we have, keep it for the next family. Um, but you just give people 100K you know, right into the asset of their home. And that's building, that's building straight into the wealth of that family. Um, and repairing, you know, it's a reparative approach, but it's using policy that already exists. Um, uh, historic wealth destruction that's happened. Um, so, you know, and I think, again, there's no silver bullet. Some people are looking at community wealth funds um, that are, um, and credit unions and public banks and things like that that are pooling, uh, resources and investing in small businesses and investing in neighborhood improvements and things like that and um, crowd equity and there you know there's a number of different um, diversified uh, questions and answers to think about um, when it comes to building wealth. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, you've given us just the right amount to keep thinking about. Um, honestly, I think you've planted exactly the seeds that we wanted to plant to hope that folks keep learning about this issue. We are just about out of time. I wanna thank Khadija and Braden and Kirk for spending their busy Thursday morning with us. I've learned so much from each of you. Um, we need you, all of you who are listening, we need you in our fight ahead. So as I said earlier, keep learning, keep talking and join us. We also ask that you take two more minutes to complete a brief questionnaire. A link is now included in the chat. Your thoughts will help us improve our upcoming work in the fight for real equity. Finally, this Real Talk has been recorded and you will be able to find it on the CCC website. Thank you for joining us this morning. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you.